So if we count soybeans, animals are a protein sink, 11 megaton deficit per year, according to the study he references. Eating less meat won't save the planet. Here's why. By what I've learned, I've covered what I've learned before. Yes, there are two parts to this because there is a lot to correct and often correcting false claims takes a lot more time than just making false claims in the first place. It's actually kind of depressing just how many videos like this there are that have so much misinformation and they end up being so popular. They end up racking up so many views. But it's not really surprising. I mean, essentially, he's telling people what they want to hear, that their bad habits are good, actually. Eating meat is fine, actually, or at least, like, not that bad, not that big of a deal. And they want to be told this in, like, a very polished, convincing way, which he absolutely achieves. I'll give him that. And he does also provide a transcript with a list of sources, which the vast majority <laughs> of YouTubers do not do, so very much appreciated. And that's pretty much where my appreciation for this video ends, because if you dig just a little bit deeper, if you look at his sources, if you actually read the studies he's referencing, it becomes clear just how wrong, even intentionally dishonest, this all is. What's the environmental impact of not eating meat? Veganism is on the rise, but getting 100% of Americans to go plant-based is unrealistic. So let's be optimistic and say we got 10% of the United States to stop eating meat. Nobody is expecting that though. The models that experts are talking about are looking at across the board reductions. They're not focused on a small portion of the population taking on all of the burden. So a small portion of the population going vegan. No, they're looking at everyone reducing. This paper is a good example. Researchers from the University of Michigan projected a 35% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions if Americans reduced animal product consumption by 50%, and then a 51% reduction if they also reduced beef by 90% instead of 50%. So even in that final, like most extreme scenario, the average American would still be eating 50 pounds of meat a year. My point is that nobody is like seriously modeling a situation where like half of the United States goes vegan and the other half just continues business as usual, just eating the same diet, because it's incredibly unrealistic, so why model it in the first place? Accounting for everything, the methane from cow burps, the emissions from animal manure, emissions from transporting and processing meat, and so on, what would be the actual reduction of the United States planet warming greenhouse gases if 33 million people went totally plant-based? Well, based on that recent projection that I just mentioned, a 50% reduction by all people in the U.S. is 35% of dietary emissions. So a fifth of that, 10%, would be 35 divided by 5, so 7%. That's obviously not enough to reach climate goals, which is why a lot of campaigns are becoming increasingly focused on, again, reduction across the board, instead of relying on a tiny portion of the population to try and carry all of the burden. To discuss this, I'm joined here with Professor of Animal Science and Air Quality Specialist at UC Davis, Dr. Frank Mitlerner. So instead of relying on published research authored by multiple professionals, Will decides to cherry pick someone involved in the animal agriculture industry whose work, um, I'll just let some experts from Johns Hopkins explain. Dr. Mitlerner states that livestock production is responsible for 4.2% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. This calculation fails to account for several major emission sources. He cites EPA estimates of enteric fermentation and manure management, but excludes emissions from the production of animal feed and forage, including nitrous oxide emissions associated with fertilizer application, land use changes, the transportation of animal feed, livestock, and food animal products, and emissions associated with imported food animal products. He draws conclusions based on data that do not reflect the full life cycle of animal products, but goes on to acknowledge that life cycle assessment methods are the gold standard for accurately measuring livestock's contributions to climate change. And to be clear, just because someone benefits financially from animal agriculture, it doesn't mean that anything and everything they have to say on the matter of climate change, animal welfare, etc., isn't worth considering. I think it's important to analyze their work on its own merits. And Dr. Mitlerner's work speaks for itself. If the entirety of the U.S. was to go vegan for a year, 
then the the reduction in emissions would be like uh, the entire U.S. going vegan would be two point six percent. Two point six percent. I thought it was four point two percent according to his own paper. Did he manage to to get it lower with some more? creative accounting? No, I'm joking. This actually comes from this paper. You may be familiar with this. It might be even more ridiculous than Mittler's work, but uh, more on that in a little bit. So if we go back to the dietary projection from earlier, an American diet with 50% less animal products results in a 35% reduction in dietary emissions. So multiply that by two for everyone going vegan, so 70% reduction in dietary emissions which themselves are about 10% of total U.S. emissions. So every American going vegan for a full year would result in around a 7% reduction in total emissions, quite a bit more than 2.6%. Do cows really take all our water? And it's not just land resources, but water as well. To end up with 24 hamburger patties, it requires the amount of water you see in this pool. So this big water footprint that everyone talks about with cows and livestock, where does that water come from? So the water input that people assign to beef includes, and that's the majority, the so-called green water. And the green water is rainwater. That rainwater would fall on that land where the animals graze with cattle present and without cattle present. I really don't know why he chose to reference the study here, considering the author's conclusion, which is that plant foods are more efficient in terms of fresh water, especially when we're looking at beef. 20 times larger than cereal grains and root vegetables, and six times larger than legumes. Here's a more recent study that I'm gonna be referencing a lot throughout this video. They found beef used 2,034 liters of blue water per kilogram of carcass weight, which is about 2,000 liters per 650 grams of beef. So what's actually sold in store retail cuts. So you end up with 3,129 grams of water per gram of beef, almost six times worse than reported in the 2010 study that Will references. Oh yeah, and I'm calling him Will. I think his name is actually Joseph going by his email address, but what I learned, Will, I did. I thought it was clever at the time. And just in case you're worried that I'm doing my own little bit of cherry picking, you know, with, with the study I chose, that I'm like shilling for Big Vegan or something, I don't know. Uh, this study was actually partially funded by Beef Checkoff. It's a national program whose whole goal is to increase the demand for beef. Now, what's really important here is not the orders of magnitude of gallons of water that like don't make sense to most of us. What really matters is comparison, how water usage compares from one food to another, as that study that Will referenced shows, as well as that Mark Rober video. Yeah, it's crystal clear that plant foods are far more efficient than animal foods. And guess what happens to that water a few hours after it's ingested? It's urinated out. It's not staying in the animal. It stays in the animal as long as the tea that you drank this morning stayed into your body. So that water is not all of a sudden recklessly gone, okay? It is going in and it's coming out. I guess Dr. Mintliner thinks that we shouldn't be so picky. Cow piss is every bit as good as clean, fresh water. Suck it up. In all seriousness, nobody is saying that this water is like miraculously disappearing. The issue is accessible, clean water being turned into something that's uh, not that. And it only returns to the water cycle at a certain rate. When we're using it up faster than it's being replenished, that's a problem. A really serious problem in some parts of the world. A problem that animal agriculture is only making worse. And this issue goes far beyond what water is used for animals in an animal agriculture? What about the water that is polluted by animals? Animal feces causing far more dangerous runoff pollution than plant agriculture. They don't even mention that in this video. I wonder why. It is disingenuous to say, oh, look at all that water that grows, that goes into, into growing cattle. Would we say the same thing about all the water that goes to trees to grow? Of course not. Anti-vegans do this all the time, complaining about almond milk and avocados as a way to deflect. I'm really surprised Will chose to leave this clip in, considering he himself talks about almonds in this very video. 94.5% of Californian almonds water usage is not green water. 
That's 1,097 liters per quarter pound, almost 10 times more than beef. Think about that the next time you're ordering an almond milk latte. When you do the math, almond milk still uses less water than dairy milk, which again is the important part, the comparison. How do these products compare to the alternative? Almond milk uses less water than dairy milk. A bean burger uses less water than a beef burger, etc. At 122 liters of non-green water per quarter pound, Beef does use more than, say, rice, which is 90 liters, or bread, which is 55 liters. According to the 2019 study I referenced, again, funded by the meat industry, it's almost three times that. It's not like that study wasn't already published when he was cherry-picking his sources for this video. We need to think about nutritional requirements when we eat. And beef is way more nutrient-dense, so yeah, 122 liters used to make a quarter pound of beef is not nothing. But you can't compare that to a quarter pound of rice, which only uses 90 liters, but provides only one fifth the protein and much less vitamins and minerals than beef. I wonder why he chose rice. Could it be because rice is one of the lowest protein grains in existence and has notoriously high water usage? <laughs> Maybe. Why not choose some sort of legume for a comparison? Great source of plant protein and requires six times less water than beef, according to the study he referenced. And that's the old study. The newer one that I reference finds beef to be six times worse, which would mean 36 times worse than legumes. If you're going to look honestly at these things, you have to look at nutritional comparables, which is what these studies already do because the authors are not dumb. They know what they're doing for the most part. We'll get to that in a minute. In the world, 84% of all li livestock feed across all species, 84% is non-human edible. The majority of animal feed is not currently eaten by humans, but that does not mean it's inedible, that it's non-nutritive or that it's harmful for humans to eat. And many of these non-human edible foods are grown to feed animals on land that could otherwise be used to grow food for humans or for forestry or just let it did it all revert, you know, back to nature? The vast majority of what we feed to ruminant livestock throughout the world, the vast majority, well over 90%, is non-human edible. Throughout the world? So now we're talking globally? I thought we were focused on the U.S. And wait, isn't this the guy who in this very interview criticizes the popular, you know, 15% of emissions come from animal agriculture statistic, criticizes that? for being a global number and not specific to the US. The world average doesn't matter. Do you see what they're doing? When they want to discredit the opposition, the consensus, then, oh, well, that's global. It doesn't count for the US. When they want to make beef look sustainable, cows eat grass, we can't eat that shit, then they'll reference global statistics. It seems like they switch between global and local statistics based on which comes out more favorable for the industry. Super cool, guys. Animal agriculture is part of a huge ecosystem. For example, a ton of otherwise useless crop byproducts produced when growing food for people can be made use of by livestock. When you grow corn, what do you do with the husks and the other stuff that comes out of the ground? You can mulch it or turn it into biofuel to displace gasoline. You can feed it to cows. Shocking. I get the feeling he doesn't understand the difference between stover and silage. Stover is the leftover nutrient-poor stalks and leaves. After the corn is harvested, it's pretty much just cellulose that's left. Silage is similar, but it's harvested before the grain is mature, so it contains more nutrients than stover does. Silage competes with human food because it means one fewer grain harvest. The cows are getting the nutrients instead of us. Stover doesn't compete with human food because it has virtually no nutritional value. Not that cows can just live on straw either. Their diets have to be self supplemented with something else, like soybean meal, uh, in order to, to live. It's not magic. The nutrients have to come from somewhere. This is why stover is better used for mulch or for biofuel, right? The yeast doesn't have to be fed a bunch of soybeans along with the straw. We can give it nitrogen from industrial sources that don't compete with human food. When you buy a package of almonds or almond milk, a ton of resources were used creating things you can't eat, like millions and millions of almond holes. These can be fed to cattle. Just this week, I went to a Japanese dairy ranch. 
plenty of soy is consumed in this country, and these cows are eating kilos and kilos of the leftover soybean skins. Soybean skins or soybean hulls are a byproduct of making soybean meal and also soybean oil. He talks about them as though they are just a totally um, like inedible, non-nutritive food, but that's not true. Most hulls are, and they're used as roughage, but not soybean hulls. And soybean meal is nutritious and human edible too, as stated in a paper he's about to reference. So is okara or soybean pulp, soy pulp, I think it's called. It's leftover from making soy milk and tofu. It's mostly used to feed farm animals. Point is, just because a product is currently being used to feed animals doesn't mean that it can't be used to feed humans or for some other purpose, like biofuel. And the more we shift to plant-based, the more likely we will see kind of waste-based <laughs> plant products on the market. I have no doubt we'll see some sort of Okara burger or tenders or, or whatever else on the market at some point in the near future. Yeah, man, I don't know. Have some more faith in humans ability to innovate. We're pretty good at that. So no, it doesn't take 25 kilograms of grain to make one kilogram of beef. A 2017 paper by Anne Motet from the FAO took into account that we can't eat most of what cows eat. So the number becomes just 2.8 kilograms of human edible stuff to make one kilogram of beef. If you look at the actual paper, you'll see this mainly has to do with food security in developing countries. They're trying to assess whether animal agriculture improves or worsens food security for those people. So those statistics, about 20-ish you know, pounds of grain per pound of beef, are roughly correct when it comes to the beef Americans are actually eating, right? Part of that 7 to 13 percent of beef that comes from a feedlot. So yeah, developing countries, food insecurity, why is he even referencing this study? This is not what we're talking about when we say people should eat less meat. We're not talking about people who are literally starving due to lack of resources. We are talking about well-off people in well-off countries like the US who have access to a wide variety of plant foods and necessary supplements so they can healthfully eat a diet that is lower in meat or even completely devoid of all animal products. That's who we're talking to. In any case, the obesity epidemic is not showing that we need more general calories. Animals take excess grain calories and turn them into a high quality, efficient source of protein. No, they don't. Animals are not nitrogen fixers. They don't just make protein. They consume protein and then incorporate that protein into their tissues. This is... This is basic biology. He clearly didn't read the paper he referenced. The argument being made is that they're taking unusable protein from things humans can't eat and turning them into meat. But even that isn't really true if you read the whole paper. So there's no question that globally animal agriculture is not a net source of protein. And it's really funny how the authors bend over backwards trying to avoid acknowledging this in their paper. They talk about meat being a net positive protein contribution, producing four megatons per year. Oh, wait, what's that last part? When adding soybean cakes, they represent a deficit of 11 megatons of protein per year? So if we count soybeans, animals are a protein sink 11 megaton deficit per year, according to the study he references. Read your sources, my dude. It's not that hard. And if it is that hard, maybe stop making these videos. Another fun little fact I gathered from actually reading, even going by their conservative standards, 43% of land that is growing food for these animals could grow food for humans, which means a total plus opportunity deficit of 83.8 megatons of protein. Animal agriculture is just an enormous protein loss and incredibly inefficient. Eating animals when you have other options is just a really stupid way to eat. Animal foods currently provide 48% of our protein, but only 24% of our calories. I see we've gone back to using US numbers and ignoring global numbers. Just trying to keep up here. He gets these figures from that ridiculous study I mentioned earlier, nutritional and greenhouse gas impacts of removing animals from US agriculture. That's one where they use the wrong numbers on GHG emissions. And then they assumed that all farms would just continue 
to grow a bunch of corn if the country went vegan. And so we'd get even fatter from eating too many calories, again, mostly from corn. And then we'd become deficient in things like vitamin A because corn doesn't contain vitamin A. And cheap plant sources of vitamin A don't exist. They just don't. Not a one. Anyway, there's a summary of criticisms here, which the authors responded to by saying they never intended to assess realistic, intermediate, or desirable diets. So they intended to produce a deceptive and useless study. Super fun. You know, it's not like climate change is a topic affecting literally every single person on this planet. In any event, obviously, meat replacements are perfectly capable of providing a similar or even superior protein to calorie ratio. And as we learned from that study, Will shared, animals consume at least three times as much potentially human edible protein than we take back from them when we kill them. Again, eating animals is just a real dumb way to eat. Real dumb. Of all agricultural land in the world, Two-thirds of that agricultural land is what we call marginal, meaning you cannot grow crops there. That's quite an exaggeration. Even with the conservative values of the study Will shared, 57% of land used to grow food for farm animals is not suitable for growing food for humans. That's a bit more than half and not even three-fifths. And more importantly, that's not even all of the agricultural land. Once we account for all of it, that number is much smaller. That study is a little inconsistent with other sources, but if only half of that were to be abandoned, that's 29%. So closer to a quarter and less than one-third of total agricultural land not two-thirds. Being as conservative as possible and starting with a more consistent source, we still don't end up with two-thirds. But the really important thing here is that they're only talking about land use and not land potential, which is how much of land that is currently being used for farmed animals could be used to grow crops to feed humans. This is what that study attempted to address. They come up with a conservative 684.9 million hectares being convertible from grazing land, a little bit of math in, and we get 54.9% unconvertible grazing land. That's still short of three-fifths. It's barely more than half. But all of this is really irrelevant. None of that even mattered. All the maths, none of it even mattered <laughs> because it doesn't matter how much land we allow to revert to nature or whatever if we still have plenty of protein for humans. Despite taking up huge amounts of space, marginal grazing lands don't actually end up producing very much. Globally, it's about 27%. Can we grow enough protein to replace it? Well, the other study's numbers suggested, yeah, three times as much, in fact, despite not wanting to admit it. Double checking with these numbers and extrapolating from what we currently grow for humans, which is conservative, right? Because it's not protein focused in the way that like meat replacement crops would be. We end up with 55% of grazing left to rewild. Using those crop and protein numbers, extrapolating current crop ratios to the new arable land where we once got 27% of global protein from animal products, we now get 60% from plants, more than double. Enough global protein to feed over 9 billion people based on current consumption. That's not as dramatic as extrapolating from the animal protein intake based on that study's numbers, maybe because the numbers are wrong or confusing, but probably because those values incorporate a larger amount of soy, which is the most likely replacement anyway. So triple the return seems more likely than the, than the two and a quarter based on those uh, calculations. Point is, the most conservative numbers give us over double, more than double the protein from plants than what we get from animal products. So we don't need that marginal land, not to feed the current population, nor even to feed up to 9 billion people. The reason why you cannot grow crops there is because it's too rocky, it's too hilly, it's, uh, the soil is not good enough or there's not enough water. First, arable land does not include permanent agriculture like fruit and nut trees, which would probably be expanded in a vegan world. These would have no trouble with rocky ground. However, even in terms of creating arable land, these are not insurmountable obstacles. Much of California would qualify as too dry, but it's farmed anyway by employing irrigation. We don't currently do it elsewhere because we have other places to grow food. That land is just not worth the cost of removing rocks and irrigating. A more useful number would be the amount of arable land that could be converted, like at 
you know, certain price points. That would actually give us a sense of what it would cost if we like ended up having to feed more than 9 billion people. The Aran Islands are a rather extreme but pretty cool example. They were basically bare rock before people covered the ground in sand and seaweed that decomposed as compost. That's what our own garden soil is. It's sand and municipal compost. Fruits and vegetables grow just fine in it. Israel is another cool example. They're transforming desert land into viable cropland using some pretty cool irrigation practices. Just in the United States, the soil conditions across regions are quite different. There is a reason California produces a huge amount of food in the United States. Over 90% of all the walnuts, almonds, pistachios, broccoli, strawberries, grapes, kiwis, celery, garlic, artichoke, tomatoes, and other foods all come from California with its warm climate and good soil conditions. Because they irrigate. He just complained about this. He just complained about irrigating almonds earlier in this video. <laughs> California is not an example of what he's talking about. It's an example of us growing food wherever we want by using irrigation. There are rare exceptions of locations with soil that's too salty or contaminated to grow, but thanks to phosphate rock and nitrogen fertilizer, the principal limitations for growing food are not soil-based. They're water, topography, and temperature. Water is a pretty easy fix. Topography as well bends to the power of modern machinery. The main issue is temperature. Obviously, we have greenhouses and hothouses, but the climate implications of feeding the population with these practices it's questionable. There are tons of areas in the world where the main thing that easily grows is grass and other things that ruminants like cows, sheep, and goats can eat. If you don't put ruminants on that land, it will go to waste. Or it will go wild. Sounds a lot better than waste, doesn't it? And I love that grass is the main thing that easily grows, but like what about the difficulty of managing herds of animals, protecting them from predators? keeping them out of roads, mitigating environmental pollution and climate change, preventing pandemics. It's a hell of a lot easier to move a few rocks or spread some phosphate than to have to deal with the catastrophic consequences of animal agriculture. Assuming we even needed that land in the first place, which we do not and likely never will. Analyses show population will likely peak at under 10 billion, which we should easily be able to feed. So that was part one. I hope you enjoyed it. Part two will be up hopefully very soon, hopefully tomorrow. And it is um, uh, more of the same, uh, kind of worse. There's, yeah, there's a lot. So <laughs> stay tuned for that. And if you liked it, like the video, consider subscribing. Of course, that will help you easily find out when part two is up. And you can support the channel, patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. And yeah, I'll have a new video soon. Thanks. So what's actually sold in store? Retail cuts, right? I hate referring to... It just sucks. All of this, you know, it's very removed from, um, from the actual animal, the actual being, the actual sentient being. So... I think even Mittliner calls them like beef animals. I don't think I've even ever heard that before. It, it's just very, ooh, wow, he's so far removed from them as uh, creatures that experience extreme suffering because of all of this, you know? And um, yeah, just hearing the term retail cuts come out of my mouth, it's like, yeah, man, long way to go.